while taking part in a team, unpredicted problems may occur at any time. However, problems are nothing but the symptoms of deeper issues. Fixing a problem quickly becomes a convenient solution, however, it doesn't protect your work process from recurring mistakes or problems. This is why every process team is required to focus on finding the root cause and tackle it properly. Thus, knowing its various techniques is very important for any workplace. Hence, today's topic is root cause analysis techniques. Hello everyone. This is George from Invensys Learning. Welcome to our YouTube channel. Let us now look into the agenda. First, let us take a quick introduction to root cause analysis. Then we shall see various RCA techniques like Pareto chart, the five whys, fishbone diagram, PDCA, failure mode and effects analysis, FMEA, Now let us start our video by discussing root cause analysis. Introduction to root cause analysis. Root cause analysis, which is usually called RCA, is a systematic approach used to analyze the fundamental problems before trying to solve them, ultimately aiming to isolate and identify the main root cause of a problem. This plays an important role in any organization because it helps solve, preventing the event from occurring is more palpable than reacting to the result in harmful effects. The RCA process usually involves data collecting, causal factor charting, root cause identification, and recommendation generation and implementation. It's typically used when something goes badly, but can also be used when something goes well. Within an organization, problem solving, incident investigation, and root cause analysis are all fundamentally connected. Upon that, RCA may be used to target opportunities for system-wide improvement. Root causes are specific underlying causes that can be reasonably identified, are within management's control to remedy, and which generate effective recommendations to prevent recurrences. Root cause analysis is done by using multiple tools and methods. In general, root cause analysis is about looking deep within the process to find what, when, and why an event triggers. So, now let us discuss some of those root cause analysis techniques and understand them. The first technique is, Pareto chart. What is a Pareto chart? A Pareto chart is a simple technique of RCA which is a combination of a bar graph and a line graph. One can notice the presence of both these bars and line graphs on the Pareto chart. In simpler words, a Pareto chart is a graph that indicates the frequency of defects, along with their cumulative impact. Pareto charts are useful to find the defects to prioritize in order to observe the greatest overall improvement. What is the Pareto principle? The Pareto chart is built based on a principle. This principle states that 80% of the results are determined by 20% of the causes. Thus, you should try to find the 20% of defect types that are directly causing 80% of all defects. So, what are its features? As you guys already saw, the Pareto chart is mainly based on the 80 to 20 principle. The other features are a Pareto chart is one of the seven basic tools used for quality control, which is a combination of both a bar graph and a line graph. In the Pareto chart, Each bar usually represents a type of defect or mistake that occurred, and also the bars are presented in descending order, and the leftmost bar indicates the highest issues or errors. And the other graph, that is, the line in the graph represents the cumulative percentage of defects. Now let us see some of its benefits. Benefits Pareto charts have many advantages. They help to prioritize the top issue for a problem and try to eliminate it first. Thereby reduces the chance of getting wasted. Then, it gives a clear idea of the cumulative impact of issues by taking better actions by corrective and preventive action. Later, it gives a focused, simple, and clear way to find vital few causes, and helps to improve problem-solving and decision-making skills. Also, it improves the effectiveness of quality management. Upon that, the Pareto chart is useful in every form of leadership decision by helping in problem-solving and decision-making, and in change in time management. After understanding the advantages of the Pareto chart, Let us now see how to construct a Pareto chart. A Pareto chart can be built by segmenting the range of the data based on different categories. For example, if you are not getting the exact details of the corona, you can categorize based on number of people infected, people who got cured, people with vaccination, death of corona patients. Then, you can arrange them in descending order so that one can easily find which can cause more defects and errors. Coming to the part of representing it, Usually as any other graph, it has two AIS. The left side vertical axis of the Pareto chart is labeled as frequency, which is the number of counts for each category. The right side vertical axis of the Pareto chart is the cumulative percentage, and the horizontal axis of the Pareto chart is labeled with the group names of your response variables. Then accordingly, 
one must take the necessary action to reduce defects and errors. Let us now see some of its examples. Pareto analysis examples. Pareto analysis can be applied literally in any scenario we see around in our day-to-day life as well. Here are some examples. 20% of employees do 80% of work. 20% of drivers cause 80% of accidents. 20% of the time spent in a day leads to 80% of work. 20% of things in the warehouse occupy 80% of storage space. 20% of employees are responsible for 80% of sick leaves. 20% of household items consume 80% of electricity. 20% of the book will have 80% of the content you are looking for. Pareto chart applied in almost every field like business, sales, marketing, quality control, sports, etc. Thus, one can get many examples. Now after understanding various aspects of the Pareto chart, let us move to the next technique, that is, the 5 whys. The 5 whys technique is one of the most effective tools for root cause analysis in the lean management arsenal. Every team faces roadblocks in its daily work. However, Using the five whys will help you find the root cause of any problem and helps in protecting the process from recurring mistakes and failures. So, what are five whys? The five whys technique is one of the simple, effective, and best tools for solving problems. It mainly aims at finding the exact reason that has caused a given problem by asking a sequence of why questions. In simple words, it helps to focus on finding the root cause of any problem. Thus encouraging each team member to share their ideas for continuous improvement rather than blaming others. Now, let us see some of the five wise features. Features. Unpredicted issues in any system are a problem for any team or process. Fixing these issues soon may be a convenient solution for this. One prominent method for doing this is by a Six Sigma method called five wise. Now let us see some of its features. Five wise is an iterative approach to finding the underlying cause of a problem which just not solves the symptoms, but also the root causes of the same. Five Whys enable to solve root problems with symptoms, fosters cross-functional collaboration and and innovation. Five Whys are one of the holistic approaches to problem-solving that ha most powerful assessment methods of all non-statistical analyzes. After understanding the varied nature of Five Whys, let us see some of its benefits. The benefits. The benefits and features of the Five Ways are abundant. The Five Whys help the team members to identify the root cause of a problem and prevent the operational problems. It easily understands how one process can cause a chain of problems, and then determines the relationship between different root causes. It also shows areas of weakness. Upon that, it is highly effective without complicated evaluation techniques, and also implementation is simpler and easy. Now, let us see. How to perform 5 whys. The simplest and best way of conducting the 5 whys is by making a note of all the linking problems. Then, create a diagram linking these issues. The diagram can reveal problems that may need the five whys for a deeper look. Accordingly, you can gather all of the root cause effect relationships and evaluate which of them had the greatest impact on the original problem. And effectively take appropriate actions on the same. The steps to be followed in conducting five whys are. The first step is to define the problem. Here you have to check what the problem is. Soon after that, you have to understand and analyze, and then create a problem statement. The next step is, create a team. Create a common team with those who are familiar with the specifics of the problem. Make a team leader who can keep the team focused on identifying effective countermeasures. The next step is, define the issue. Observe the problem. Discuss and note down all the details with your team and write a brief, clear problem statement. The last step is to ask questions, first why? Till five whys. Asking why? May sound very simple, but answering it requires serious thought. Search for answers. Those answers must be accounts of things that have actually happened, not guesses at what might have happened. This prevents five whys from becoming just a process of deductive reasoning, which can generate a large number of possible causes and, sometimes, create more confusion as you chase down hypothetical problems. Now let us see an example of five whys. Example. The five whys technique is one of the most effective tools for root cause analysis in the lean management arsenal. Every team faces roadblocks in its daily work. However, Using the five whys will help you find the root cause of any problem and protect the process from recurring mistakes and failures. This Six Sigma method uses five questions to understand the root cause of a problem. It's a simple method to implement. Consider an example where a student comes late to the exam. So, if applied five whys, we can start by asking. Why came late? The reason would be to leave home late. So, the next why is, why did you left home late? The reason maybe woke up late. 
Next question is, why woke up late? The answer would be, for it to keep alarmed. The next question is, why forgot to keep alarmed? The reason would be, I was busy reading for the exam. The last why is, why were you busy reading? The reason is exam pressure. So, just by asking these five whys, you can find the root of the problem caused. After five whys, next, we have Fishbone Diagram The fishbone diagram is a cause and effect diagram that usually helps managers to track down the reasons for imperfections, variations, defects, or failures. It is also called as Ishikawa Diagram and Cause-Effect Diagram. The diagram looks just like a fish's skeleton, hence the name. Here, we write the problem in its head and the causes for the problem feeding into the spine. Once all the causes have been identified, managers can start looking for solutions to ensure that the problem doesn't become a recurring one. So, what is a fishbone diagram? The fishbone diagram is considered one of the seven basic quality tools. The fishbone diagram identifies many possible causes for an effect or problem. It can be used to structure a brainstorming session. It immediately sorts ideas into useful categories. A fishbone diagram is one of the visualization tools used for categorizing the potential causes of a problem. This tool is usually used in order to identify a problem's root causes, so it typically becomes a root cause analysis technique. Usually, a fishbone diagram is a combination of the practice of brainstorming with a type of mind map template that determines cause and effect. It is also used in the range from product development to troubleshooting processes used to focus a conversation around a problem. So, coming to the features part. Firstly, a fishbone diagram is a tool that is used to visualize all the potential causes of a problem. Also, this diagram discovers the root causes of a problem. Upon that, the fishbone diagram is a visual representation of the factors that contributes to an observed effect that is being examined. Then, this tool analyzes a problem statement and brings quality improvement, and also builds interrelationships among the possible causal factors. Coming to the advantages part. Fishbone diagram identifies cause and effect relationships with all the terms. Then, the head of the diagram represents problems, so it is easy to depict the causes easily. Also, helps to develop brainstorming. Then, this diagram is easy to understand and develop compared to many other similar diagrams. Also, it provides permanent solutions to the problems that occurred. Upon that, it also helps in developing a logical approach to solving problems. Now let us discuss. How to build a fishbone diagram. Fishbone diagrams are typically worked right to left, with each large bone of the fish branching out to include smaller bones, each containing more detail. Now let us see the steps to create a fishbone diagram. First, take a problem, and treat it as a problem statement. Place this on the rightmost side. In comparison to fish, it is in the place of a fish eye. Next, draw a straight arrow pointing to the problem statement. In this arrow, brainstorm the major categories of causes of the problem. Some of the generic categories include machines, people, materials, measurement, environment, etc. Represent this with different lines. Now, in all these categories, mention the main points. By the end of this process, you should be able to build a fishbone diagram. And once the diagram is done, you can completely analyze the problems and take necessary actions. Let us now talk about this technique by discussing an example. Consider a company where they produce a product. But, due to no proper marketing, they are not able to reach more customers. So, they start using a fishbone diagram to find the problem. Now how they use the fishbone diagram? Let us take a look at it. According to the procedure, first, write the problem to the rightmost side. Now, draw an arrow where you mention all your reasons for the causes. Then, add arrows to mention those reasons. So, what all would be the main assets? Those are place, people, price, promotion, and many more. But, the top ones would be these. Now understanding the terms of each aspect, we can find the solution for the problem. So, starting with the place, the first point is, no proper area. You need to find a proper area where you can find a good amount of customers who can choose your product. Next, proper selling of goods is not happening. You must choose that place where you have the choice of selling whatever you need. Then, you need to be sure that, no other people are selling the same or similar kind of product. Next, we have, people. The first point is, no good customer. It is true that you cannot impress everyone with your product, but you need to have some regular customers with you. Once they are fixed, you can get a small promotion of your products through them. Then, no loyal customers. To keep our customers loyal, you must be sure about the quality of the product you are selling. 
Then, we have, price. No clear ratings are present. Due to this, customers may shy to reach you. No clarity in the amounts mentioned. You may be having two pieces of the same product, but both are of different cost. And, you may face loss due to this. Then, we have, promotion. Firstly, no proper promotion, maybe through social media, pamphlets, or any other medium. Then, lack of communication. Because of this, you are not able to showcase your products. Now to make you all guys understand even better, let us consider a real-time example. You guys are aware that many accidents are occurring every day. But, one needs a way to understand why these are caused. To understand the root causes, we shall make use of a fishbone diagram. So, how to start? According to our discussion previously, we must first consider the problem. In this scenario, the occurring of accidents is the problem or what you can call is a cause. Now, we have to brainstorm the main categories that are responsible for the occurring of the cause. So, what are those categories? The first one would be no proper condition of the road. We can mention the next category as high-speed vehicles. Then, we can mention use of old vehicles as the next category. Not following traffic rules can become our next category. Avoiding safety gears may become our last category. Now, we shall move to our next step, that is, we shall brainstorm each category. So, firstly we have, bad condition of the road. So, how does this affect the accidents occurring? Because of no proper road condition, there may cause road problems and due to this, the upper layer of the road gets disturbed. Due to this, riding smoothly on the road is not possible and may lead to accidents. Then, we have high-speed vehicles. When the speed of the vehicle reaches an extreme limit, it is difficult to control it when any other vehicles come across it. And, at high speed, the vehicle needs a greater distance to stop i.e. braking distance. This may be difficult and may cause accidents. Next, we have usage of old vehicles. Because of old vehicles, the condition of the vehicles will be very bad. And due to this sudden braking system, starting action may become difficult. Hence, it leads to accidents. The next category is, not following traffic rules. When light is displayed in the signal, many people do not follow it. And at the same time, when the other side of the road has a chance to travel, and once they meet, it may lead to severe damage to vehicles and humans causing it to be an accident. Then, not applying proper indicators in the vehicles may also lead to accidents. The last category is avoiding to use of safety gears. So, sometimes, there are chances that, you may become safe from accidents if you have put seat belts with respect to a four-wheeler, or a helmet with respect to a two-wheeler. Or applying handbrake can reduce the chances of occurring accidents. The next technique is PDCA. The Plan Do Check Act cycle is a four-step model used for carrying out change. This brings continuous improvement if implemented. Thus, the PDCA cycle is considered a project planning tool. S0, what exactly does PDCA mean? The PDCA cycle mainly aims to establish a continuous model for the continuous improvement of processes by identifying the problems. PDCA is a model that is useful for any learning process and improvement. Let us see some of the PDCA features. To begin with, PDCA is a simple and effective approach for solving problems. It is very helpful for implementing total quality management or Six Sigma. Upon that, it can also be used in companies of all sizes to improve and optimize management. Then, PDCA is an iterative approach that allows control and analysis of the problems. Also, it encompasses much of the same framework as strategic management. Coming to the advantages part. Many organizations make use of PDCA to enhance their internal and external processes. They often deploy the PDCA methodology to minimize errors and maximize outcomes. The other advantages are. PDCA has greater efficiency and effectiveness useful for testing improvement measures on a small scale. It also makes the decision-making by managers easier. Upon that, improves project risk management and can be helpful in all situations. Now, we shall discuss how PDCA is performed. PDCA methodology mainly involves a continuous improvement process through PDCA cycles. So, what are the various PDCA stages? The stages of the PDCA cycle encourage accurate planning and measuring effective methods through feedback. Here are the steps of the PDCA cycle. The first one is plan. In this stage, the business improvement professional identifies an opportunity for change and is actively planning on ways to implement the same. Do, the next step is to apply the proposed change to the process. But, it is preferred to start on a small scale. Check, at this point, it is required to analyze the obtained results and determine whether it made a difference by implementing. Act, 
The last stage of the cycle is to implement all that you had decided. If you feel that the plan didn't drive the desired results, then it's necessary to begin the cycle again. However, if your experiment was a success then it's time to drive changes on a large scale. Now, let us understand PDCA even better by taking a simple example. Consider a manufacturing industry where they want to start a new product. So, how do they begin? Of course, the first action will be to plan. So, how will they do that? First, they should identify and understand the product. Perhaps if the standard of a finished product isn't high enough, or an aspect of your marketing process should be getting better results. Then, gather all the information available in full. Then, create ideas, and develop a robust implementation plan. Then you have to do it, which means to implement it. Once you've identified a potential method of creating the product, it is now time to implement it. By doing this, you can get to know whether the action made will achieve the desired outcome. For instance, you can organize a trial within your team, in a limited geographical area. Soon after this, gather data to show whether the new implementation has worked or not. This helps in advancing your next stage. Once you implement the process of creating a new product, you must check. So, how to do that? First, analyze your project's results with the expectations that you defined in the planning stage, to assess whether your idea was a success. If not, then it is better to get back to the planning stage than to move to the net stage. You may also decide to try out more changes, and repeat the do and check phases. But if your original plan definitely isn't working, you'll need to return to the first stage. Once verification is done, then move to the act stage. This is where you implement your solution. But also keep in mind that PDCA is a loop and not a process with a beginning and end. Your improved process or product becomes the new baseline, but you continue to look for ways to make it even better. Now let us discuss the last topic. Failure Mode and Effects Analysis, FMEA. Failure Modes and Effects Analysis which is usually referred to as FMEA documents current knowledge and actions about the risks or failures to bring continuous improvement in their workplace. So, what does FMEA mean? Failure Mode and Effects Analysis, FMEA, is a structured approach that is used to discover potential failures that may exist within the design of a product or process. Failure modes are one of the ways in which a process can fail. Effects are one of the ways that these failures can lead to many wastes, defects, or harmful outcomes for the customer. So, failure mode and effects analysis is designed mainly to identify, prioritize and limit these failure modes. FMIA refers to as good engineering as it applies the knowledge and experience of a cross-functional team, CFT, to review the design progress of a product or process by assessing its risk of failure. Coming to the Features part FMIA provides a structured approach for evaluating, tracking, and updating the design. It is a systematic, proactive method for evaluating a process. In addition to that, it acts as a tool for improving both product and process design. Also, VIA is a qualitative and systematic tool. Then, VIA is considered the most effective low-risk technique for predicting problems. So, let us now see some of the benefits of VIA. Failures can be prioritized based on the seriousness of its consequences, how often it occurs, and how easily they can be detected. The purpose of the FMIA is to take actions to eliminate or reduce failures, starting with the highest priority ones. FMIA has the higher capability of verification and validation of changes. It also helps to find the possible causes of failures. It can also be used in improved design for manufacturing and assembly, DFM A. Also, it has lower cost solutions that easily help to document and identify where in a process lies. Procedure to perform FMIA. FMIA is used during design to prevent failures. Later it's used for control, before and during the ongoing operation of the process. Ideally, FMIA begins during the earliest conceptual stages of design and continues throughout the life of the product or service. The first step in performing FMIA is to identify the failures and effects. Here you have to analyze the functional requirements and note down their effects. By this, you can identify all the failure modes. So, what are failure modes? Failure modes are that one component that can induce failure. By this, one can reach failure effects like overthinking, noise, injury, etc. Next, you have to define severity. But what is the severity? Severity is nothing but the state of the seriousness of either failure consequence or failure effect. Soon after this step, you have to examine the causes that are leading to failure. One must brainstorm every possible failure mode, its occurrence, how often it occurs, how long it exists, and its effects. So, it is important to mention all these failure modes in a document for future references. 
Some examples include huge usage of properties, wasting resources, fluctuations due to varied reasons, incorrect algorithms, etc. After this, you will reach the final step, that is, failure detection. After taking considerable actions, it is recommended to test and verify its stage. By doing this, one can easily identify the area of the misconception that is leading to the failures and wrestling in hazardous effects. Let us now discuss an example of FIA. Let us now take an example of a coffee maker. So, it's basically a machine that produces coffee. So, let us think, the coffee obtained as an end result is not up to the expected level. So, now we have to find the exact process where the machine is going wrong, to do this, we shall use FIA. So, how to perform this? You must segregate the process step. So, the first process step would be coffee beans that must get easily powdered. Next, the amount of coffee mixing with milk. Then, the mixing process. Then, we have to rate them in the range of 1 to 10, with 1 being the least and 10 being the highest score. Then, rate them in accordance to severity, probability of occurrence, and probability of detection. After this, one can calculate RPN, which means risk preference number which is nothing but the product of severity, probability of occurrence, and probability of detection. Now, according to the present performance of the coffee maker, one must rate them in the given range. From a study, it can be rated that, for the first process, coffee beans getting powdered, we have severity as 5, the occurrence is 2, and detection is 4. Similarly, for the second process, the ratio of milk to coffee powder, we have 5, 8, and 9. And, for the last step, that is, mixing of them, we have, 3, 9, and 7. Now, after this, we have to calculate RPN. So, finally, for the first process, W have RPN as 40. Then, for the next step, we have, 360, and for the last step, we get 189. Now, we have to check the failure, so considering the values of RPN, we can say that the second step is the stage where failure has occurred and it becomes a failure mode. This is because, if RPN is less than 100, we can consider it negligible. If it is more than 300, we have to consider it seriously. So, the second process is the particular stage where action has to be taken. After implementing the change, and after some duration of one month, if the same study is done on the coffee maker, one can find significant changes. Thus, it is proved that FMIA can detect the failure and its effects. Now, at the end of the video, you guys would have realized that root cause analysis, RCA, is a tool that is used in identifying what, how, and why an event has occurred so that steps can be taken to prevent them in the future. Thus, this approach identifies the underlying causes of an incident so that the most effective solutions can be identified and implemented. So, knowing all the RCA techniques is very essential. One better way to understand those terms is by taking RCA through Six Sigma course from Invensys Learning and gain knowledge on 8D principles, Pareto chart, said, 5 whys, and pitfalls to avoid in determining and analyzing the root cause.